Okay, so what we are about to do here, <clears throat> I would like to consider this one as like the peak of the course. <clears throat> and because we have five lectures left, I think, and I think we have to do like one makeup because I miss one Monday, extra Monday. So uh, I have already looked at the table. So we have five lectures left, uh, including this one. So I might have to ask you guys, you know, for uh, like a, a extra slot for a makeup class. However, all right, if the time isn't sort of like worked out for you, then uh, what you can al al always, you can go back and take a look at the, 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 the video on YouTube, all right? But that's one one lecture that I have to pretty much squeeze into our schedule here. All right, but anyway, we have two weeks left for class and we are sort of dive to it. Uh, I think this is gonna be the peak. The reason I said it's the peak of the course is not by the difficulties level, but I think it's just because it's new, okay? <laughs> I think, because what you are about to see here, I would say this is a thing that you haven't done before in other physics stuff, wow. <laughs> seriously. So it's like, um, it's not like Newtonian physics, but it has a flavor of something that we have already built on either the electric field or some connections with the electric potential. Then you saw some vector calculus there. So this is another vector calculus that is going to come into play. However, eventually this vector calculus was a tool for explaining Gauss's law. So this is gonna be the law that we are going to be focusing on. And the concepts that I'm going to introduce to you today is called electric flux, okay? And by knowing what the electric flux is, eventually that will allow you to understand what the Gauss's law is about. And once you get that one down, then we're gonna take a look at some applications of that Gauss's law. But the thing is this, all right? I just wanna sort of like give you a peace of mind a little bit. I think the hardest part is right here. That's what we are about to learn today. Once you get this one done, Gauss's law to me is like a very, very simple extension of the understanding of electric flux. Does that make sense? Okay. It's probably not going to make sense anything now. <laughs> but I mean, what I'm trying to say is I would like to give you the, the, the right focal point, I would say. Okay. <laughs> so I think I would like to introduce this topic by having you guys focusing on the understanding of electric flux, not the Gauss's law itself. I know that's that's my take on this. All right. It seems like, well, I don't know, from the textbook or whatever, I don't know, they pretty much like emphasize, of course, they're gonna be Gauss's law. That's the main focus of everything. However, to understand Gauss's law, to me, it's this flux dude here. <laughs> it's this guy here that's responsible for everything. If you don't understand how to calculate flux. There's no way that you're going to understand Gauss's law. And if you don't understand Gauss's law, then forget about application. And on top of that, you won't believe it. The application of Gauss's law is going to be super straightforward because I don't have much to teach. <laughs> the, you will see that that's going to be the business of next uh, lecture. But you will see that because of the introduction of this Gauss's law, it's very limited applications. The scope of application is gonna be very small. So that means in this course, I'm going to be able to give you maybe only like a couple or a few examples to showcase how to use Gauss's law and that's it. So it's not gonna be like a super crazy, like, okay guys, you have sigma f equal to ma and then I throw you like crazy, like out of this world mechanics and all this stuff for you to analyze, no. It's going to be like super straightforward applications. All right. So you guys, even though I said this is the peak of the course, it seems to me this is the hardest part of the course. However, the hardest, I don't think it might not be as hard as problems in thermodynamics, but I think it's difficult is due to the, the freshness of the topic. Wow. <laughs> it's something else that you might have not done before. Plus, you have to deal with the vector calculus. That's why it makes things kind of like you double the complication, that's all. 
Okay. And once you sort of get to deal with flux a little bit, Gauss's law a little bit, and it's sort of natural to follow up this whole business with capacitor and capacitance. That's it. All right. So that's going to be the main stuff that we're going to do, guys. Just relax today. I don't have much to teach. The reason I say not much, because I'm just going to look at this. That's it. That is it for today. But it's going to be a long lecture talking about flux. Okay. When I say long, because I want you to take this two hours. <laughs> okay. Get used to this thing. All right. And I hope by spending, you know, two quality hours with you guys, then you have enough time for your brain to absorb this whole whatever concepts of flux. All right. And then you probably don't need to revise it at your own time again. So we can just like officially use the time together to understand this topic. And I'm pretty much guarantee you, if you sort of get a clue of what this is, Gauss's law is going to be a piece of cake. All right, let's take a look at it. What is electric flux? So it's just like a fancy name, trying to name something that you have already familiar with, which is the electric field lines right here, guys. Okay, so we already used this sort of like symbol over here just to try to visualize your electric field, right? Using arrows, or you can think of it like a rays. So what you have over here is the electric field lines. And everyone seems to remember if you guys if I try to draw this one and anything, if you remember this thing, remember like we had this shape of electric field lines before, some like this. Yeah. All right. And we were talking about like if I if I have like a, a cross a cross sectional area, and I place these two areas into two positions, the one on the left and the one on the right. You guys told me that on the left seems like the electric field is going to be stronger. So you guys agree with this? Okay. Yeah, because you said, because the number of lines per unit area is high on the surface A. In relative to surface B, you have less amount of electric field lines. Does that make sense? All right, so you say, okay, electric field should be strong on surface A and weaker on surface B. So we concluded last time, briefly, we didn't pay attention to that very much. We just said, it seems like the density of lines give you the information about the strength of the electric field. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's what we're going to use now. So that number of few lines divided by the surface area, that's what we're going to use, that gives you the line's density, which be able to give you the information about the size or the magnitude of the electric field over that area. Cool? So I put the proportion over here to say that's proportional to the density of lines. However, what we're going to do today is like, okay, instead of introducing an any extra constants or whatever, I'm just going to make this like an equal sign. I'm just going to make an equation out of it. And the number of field lines, I'm going to use the notation of this capital Phi is a Greek letter over here, divided by area. Does that sound good? And that's it, guys. Okay. That's it for today. That's our lecture here. It's just All right. So that's what it means. The electric field is just the number of lines per unit area. And instead of keep saying number of line, number of field lines, number of field lines, that is the electric flux. Okay, so the electric flux is the measure of the number of electric field lines penetrating through a cross sectional area or some area A. Okay, so I can rearrange this equation if you would like to calculate number of flux within some surface area having the electric field penetrating through E, you can put it in a product form like this. Does that make sense? Cool. No problem, right? The only question is this. In general, when you want to count the number of lines, you probably want to count this like one, two, three, or in reality, you're not going to count like one, two, three like this, right? You're going to do the self calculation there, right? <laughs> All right, but anyway, just for this figure alone, you just count this. That's good, 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 right? So these are no problem. You can count it. However, what happens if the electric field does not really penetrate through this area in that particular direction? So let's say if your direction of the electric field go with some angle, 
Oops, sorry, wrong direction there. There you go. What if it goes like this? Do you want to count this? Does this vector, electric field vector, actually penetrating, do you think? Oh, that's supposed to be, oh, it's keep the, the free. <laughs> I don't know why it's refreshed all the time. See? Huh. Do you want to count this whole the electric field lines? The answer is no. Okay? No. The reason for that is because it does not penetrate the area in the perpendicular direction. Cool. How can you avoid or how can you remedy this thing? No problem, Madan. You just break this into two components. The one that go perpendicular to the, elect, uh, to the surface area and the other one just go perpendicular to that area. I'm sorry, parallel to that area. There you go. <laughs> Let me write a bigger one there. There you go. Okay, does this give you a, a, like a, a good sense of what is about to happen? So every time that you have the electric field lines pointing not perpendicular to the area, all you need to do is just break that electric field into two components. That will be one component that is perpendicular. You can call this E perpendicular. And there will be another one that is parallel to the area. You can call that E parallel. And which one do you want to count? Of course, you're going to count this one because that E perp penetrating. When you say penetrating, I want a penetration to happen at 90 degree. That's one you kind of want to count them. This one, no, I don't want to count it. Cool. So now you have sort of like a good idea what will happen if you have another electric field lines. That it turns out to go like this. Okay, look at this. If you have an, another electric field that actually just pass by, sort of like it doesn't do any penetration, but it just glances through the surface air, just like you know, passing, no penetration, no going through. So this whole thing will give you nothing. There will be no flux due to this green electric field line. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. All right. Quiet means yes. <laughs> All right, so with that in mind, so it seems like what we really care about is, of course, the perpendicular direction. That's guaranteed. So if you look at this expression over here, see, there is a perp sign over there. But then you say, but Ajahn, wait a second. What you wrote over here, this is perpendicular from the electric field vector. But over here, this is a perpendicular. It's not an e perpendicular. So what is going on over here? What's going on is vector calculus. Well, it's not vector calculus, you said. It's just vector uh, the vector properties. All right, so follow me up. Uh, follow me here, guys. Let me explain to you by showing. Now I'll need more space here, so I'm going to add one more page here. And if tell me if you still remember this. Okay, I need a line. There you go. All right. Now, everyone remember this for sure. I have a mass. I have a force pulling this mass with the force F. And this mass slides horizontally along the distance S. All right. So you can put this one as the displacement vector S. Everyone knows how to calculate the work done by the force. The work done is you said it's F, S, and then you have the cosine theta. Remember that one? Yeah, cool. Well done. That's no problem. That's just a definition of work done by the force. What does this mean? When you put this into a sentence, you said the work done equal to force multiplied by the displacement in the direction of force, right? The displacement in the direction of force. That's what usually that what you're saying. But what you really do was you break this force into two components. Right? And it, is this the same thing as what you did? <laughs> what you say was just like, Ajahn, I'm going to take this F cosine theta. And I'm going to take this, multiply by this, because now they are parallel to each other. And then you're done. So actually what you did was more like F cosine theta times S. See? So my point that I'm trying to make right now is, 
the cosine theta can be thought of is attached to the displacement s, or you can think of the cosine theta as being attached to the force f. Cool. <laughs> so what I'm saying over here is because the key point of the, con the definition of the work is the force in the direction of the displacement or equivalently is the displacement in the dire direction of force. So what I'm going to be able to do equally the same is if you look at the S vector, I can do the component of that as well. Let me call this S cosine theta and S sine theta. You guys with me? So you have two choices. You either take the component of the F in the direction of S, or you can take the component of S in the direction of F. Same thing. These two are the same. And then you put this in a vector form called F dot S. Cool. Okay. So this reminds you everything that you have done. In I hope. Yes. <laughs> All right. This is a dot product, or maybe they call it scalar product because the results of this vector multiplication through the dot give you the scalar quantity work. Nice. So you give you any clue here? So look at here. So when I say I want just the E component that is perpendicular to the area. So if you know the angle between these two are theta, what you need over here is E cosine theta. So what I'm saying is the E perp, E perpendicular is that E cosine theta. So what I can actually say is going to be E cosine theta times A. Does that make sense? And then I can do the same analysis. Actually, I can put a that cosine theta attached to the A. So that means this equation will look like E cosine, I'm sorry, E times A cosine theta. And I can call this A cosine theta my A perpendicular as well. So what I'm trying to say at this moment here is, hey guys, I'm going to turn this equation into a vector operation, that dot. Okay. The only thing that's missing is, well, I can wait a second. Talking about the force and the displacement, that sounds fine because displacement and force, they are vectors. But what the heck are you doing over here? There's only one term that make it a vector, which is electric field. However, the area is not. So here comes the question, guys. Do you think area is a vector or not? You probably say about no. <laughs> because... You learn it like from you know elementary school. The way that you can find your electric uh, uh, to find area is just the width times the length or whatever, right? You never thought of it as a vector. Okay, let me grab something here. So if you have this piece of paper over here, <clears throat> okay, I put it in this direction. You guys know that the orientation of this piece of paper is upward. I can flip this one facing you guys. Now your orientation changes. Even though the area of this area will, will not change because it's just the width times the length. So the piece of the area does not change. Cool? But the orientation could be different in space. See, I can point this thing upward to the left, to the right. Doesn't matter. So that means what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce the area vector. Okay. Yes, we follow so far. So the area vector is going to be defined like this. This piece of paper right here, because the orientation is up, <laughs> facing up, I'm going to introduce a vector that point perpendicular to the actual surface. Cool? Up. One more time. If this one facing you, the vector is going to point toward your face. If this surface pointing in some angle over there, your, the vector that's representing the surface is going to go perpendicular to it. It seems to me the easiest way to think of the directions of the area is going to be thinking about your hairs. 
<laughs> on your body. <laughs> so think of it like you know, if you can make your hair sort of like sticking up yeah, everywhere, your hair is everywhere sticking up, seeing a ghost or something like that. <laughs> so that direction of your standing up hair are the vector directions. Is the vector of your surface area, your skin surface area. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it is. So from now on, every time you have a surface area A, you can assign a vector to it by having the vector point perpendicular to it. And that will be a vector. I put an arrowhead on top. Cool. All right. Of course, but then you have two directions. I mean, sort of two sides that you can pick. Why you pick pointing up? Why don't you pick pointing down? Well, yeah, you're right. The thing is, that is correct. You can pick either directions because what you are facing at this point, this is an open surface. So when the surface is open, you have two directions that you can pick for the area vector. However, lucky for us, what we need is going to be a closed surface. So think of like a balloon. A balloon doesn't look like that. Okay, a balloon like this. Okay. Or think of like your body, let's say, assume that you don't talk about your opening in your body. Your body is pretty closed. So if that is the case, then you have an inner volume that is enclosed by this closed surface, and you have an outer portion of this surface. That is good because with that, we will always pick the area vector to be pointing outward from the enclosed volume all the time. So there will be no ambiguity whatsoever. Okay. Okay. All right. So everything will be cool. It's like if it's closed. So your area vector is always pointing outward. So you only have single directions. So we agree on that. That is our agreement. That's our convention there. Cool. All right. So with that, directions of the area vector is defined. Now, can you see where I'm at? <laughs> so I'm going to be able to turn this into a vector equation. All right, so let's take a look at this. Here we go, guys. Now, let's say that if I have a piece of an area that oriented with some angle with respect to the direction of the electric field as shown in this figure over here. All right, so now to be a little bit clearer, I can draw this one from the side view, if you like. So the side view will go some like this. Oh, sorry, there's some angle there. Yeah. Side view, this one will go like this. Electric field pointing down. Let's go like that. Go like that. Okay, and of course, you're going to have some angle going like this. That's a side view of this data, cool? All right, so with that, electric field is pointing downward. That's no doubt. That's no problem. So what I'm going to show you is this. All right, because this one is an open surface, so I just want to make it sort of like convenient for us. So let's say your area vector is going to point perpendicular to this. So let me choose pointing down to make theta less than 90 degree. So this elect, I'm sorry, this that area vector it's going to point in this direction. You guys seem to follow now. The area vector is pointing perpendicular to the actual surface. The actual surface is blue. The area vector is pointing perpendicular to it. Now, the angle between E and A is going to be this theta at this as well. So what do you do? You only want the area that is pointing perpendicular or parallel. You want just the parallel component, right? Because you define your area vector to be already perpendicular to the actual surface. Okay. Because you want flux to be the electric field lines that go perpendicular to the actual surface. So in terms of vectors, you want the E and the A vectors to be pointing in the same directions. Is that cool? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense? So that's what I'm saying is, now what I can do is I can break this A into two components. One component will be downward component here, A cosine theta, 
and there'll be another component there, horizontal one that's A side theta. And everyone can clearly see that, okay, once I'm done with this, I discard the original. The A sine theta is the one that you don't want because the A sine theta is actually perpendicular to the E. Okay, so you only want the one that actually parallel to the E itself. So what I'm trying to keep saying like repetitively up to this point is, if you have E vector that is parallel to the A vector, that is going to be this condition that you take into account to be the flux piercing through that area. Isn't that good? Okay. Okay, but now we can speak in terms of the vectors saying that every time that you want two vectors to point along the same direction and then you do the products between them, you can use the dot product. So that's why I'm just going to use E dot A. And this is the condition that guaranteeing you that you only take into account the electric field that is pointing perpendicular to the area. So this one is exactly what we need, E A perp, and that is E A cosine theta. That's what I'm trying okay. to do. Understand this thing here. I don't know, you guys still follow up to this point? Is it so far so good? Or is this like already lost like 10 minutes ago? <laughs> cool. So the newest stuff that you are seeing at right here is now we are introducing the area vector. And this vector is being defined to be perpendicular to the actual area. So every time that you want E, to be parallel to the A, it's the same thing that, that you're saying that you want E to actually going through the A perpendicularly. Cool? So it seems like it's easier to speak in terms of the dot product because once you define the area vector to be perpendicular to the actual area, and then you do the dot product, that's automatically guaranteed that you only care about the electric field that's piercing through that surface area perpendicularly. Okay. 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 And not only that, look at this component one more time, guys. So I'm going to draw this one here, here, this, this, this one here. This is the one that you wanted, right? You wanted this one, right? So if I want to ask you back, well, hey guys, because we already defined the area vector to be the represents uh, to be the vector that representing the actual area that is perpendicular to this vector, right? My question that I'm going to ask you one more time, what do you think the A cosine vectors, the component of this one, is representing the actual area? You, you understand my question here? <laughs> because every area vector has to be representing the actual area, right? However, you already break the area vector A, the black one here, into the A cosine components. But the A cosine is also another vector, but it's just a component, right, that is pointing down. So I'm asking you back, well, hey, guys, is this A cosine vector representing some surface? It has to be, right? What kind of surface is that? What do you think? Okay. All right. I'm going to have to hold, hold on one second, guys. All right. So what does this A cosine theta is actually trying to tell you? It has to tell you that there is an, a, a real area waiting for you, right? But because it's a, a vector representing an area, so that means the actual area has to be perpendicular to this as well. You guys with me? <laughs> I don't know if you're getting in this or not. So the A cosine theta, so now let me highlight this thing in black. Here, this is your A cosine theta. So the actual area has to be perpendicular to it. So I'm going to draw this thing like very dark here. Here we go. See, perpendicular, that's a condition that we have. Cool. So look on the, the figure on the right. Do you see something here? So the A cosine theta is pretty much the same thing as all right, when you think in terms of the vector, everything is fine because you're doing the, the decomposition of a vector, right? But in terms of the real area, you can think equally well with the projection or the shadowing of that area. So think of it this way, if I shine a light 
light in the direction of the electric field going through this air, it will cast a shadow. Here, you guys with me? There is a shadow of that. So think of this blue area as like a roof, Milanka or something, right? And it provides a shade and shadow beneath that roof. That area here, that's a cosine theta. Isn't that okay. cool? Okay. Okay. And I think what they're trying to say, even though I think they, they're not doing a good job of keeping the scale, but I think that's what they're trying to say is something like this. But anyway, don't worry about the figure on the right. But saying that, if the area is not perpendicular to the E, that's okay. You only take the component that is perpendicular to the E. And that is the E. Uh, that uh, Sorry. You only take the component of the A, the area that is perpendicular to the E, and that is the A cosine theta. But having had the area vector defined, so the area that you actually care about is going to be the component of the real area in blue as well. And that component is just the shadow. Okay. Isn't that, I mean, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> All right, if you guys talk like, okay, still unsure or still unclear what is going on, don't worry. I will keep talking about this flux, about the component of this, about the area vectors in so many examples in the future. All right, but at least that give you a glimpse of what is about to happen regarding the flux and how can we define the area vector and utilize it using the dots product that we're familiar with from calculation of the work equal to the force dot you know, displacement, yeah? Does this help so far so good? All right, so in conclusion, now you understand that flux is just E times A, but what we want is that there must be in the perpendicular direction to each other, but now you have a technique that you put them into a vector form, so that equation can be briefly called E dot A. And now you can think of the cosine theta to be attached to the cosine theta A, or attached to the E, so it's going to be E cosine theta A, up to you. They are all the same thing now. Does this help? <laughs> all right, so move on, all right? I think it's something is building up, right? Okay, so here we go. So to make things a little bit proper, and we're going to define it properly now, so Ba'atan, in reality, how are you going to write this one down and to make things a little bit clearer, or at least that allow you to read other textbook in case sort of like easier to your eyes. So this is how you write it down. So now this is we defined your area vector. The way is easy. You take the width times the height. Okay. Okay. And then just do the n hat. <laughs> the hat is the units vector again, but the n is representing the normal. So what I'm saying is from now on, every time you have a piece of area A, what you can do is just giving this a vector perpendicular to that. And because you know it's going to point up, so what you say is you just define this one as an n hat. Does that make sense? So the area vector at the end is going to be that A, the magnitude A, times the N, and that will give you the area vector A times N hat. That is your A vector. Is that cool? Okay. All right. So this is just a representation. And the N, good thing about having the N hat right here is just it's reminding you that the vector of the area is always perpendicular to the actual area surface. Cool. All right. And this will allow you to understand this whole expression over here. And I hope, once again, I can squeeze in the E cosine theta A too. Now that's your choice. You can think everything in two ways now. You can break the A vector in the direction, and make it into the direction of E, or you can break the E and put it in the direction of A, up to you. And once you have those two parallel components, you then just multiply them, and that is the dot products. Cool? All right, and if you look at the progression of the figure on the right, I don't know you guys hearing my background noise. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a problem with the work from home here. 
thing that is they're doing some construction. I mean, cleaning the AC right now. Okay, so what you have over here is, is this a progression of what we have so far? There's an electric field point from left to right. There is an area A that makes some angle theta with the electric field lines here. And then what you have here is, here, this is what you did. You can break E and then you just take, you decompose the E and only bring in the E that is perpendicular to A. So you take this E cosine theta. So this one way of doing it, or another way of doing it is you take the A vector and then you break this A vector into A cosine theta component. And this A cosine theta is what? It's just the shadow behind this thing. Cool? And that's complete the introductions or the definitions or the, the whatever the, 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 the agreements on what we're going to, to do to calculate electric flux right there, guys. Okay. This is good. Oh, this is kind of like, I know it's kind of a lot. <laughs> All right. So if you sort of get this idea here, okay, now this is what we have. So look at this one here. So you have a closed surface as promised. So this is the one that we have right there. Okay. So what I want you to think today is right now, all right, we're not going to do a lot of calculation today, guys. It's purely just theory. It's purely just introduction to the equations or to expressions. So just make sort of like a relaxing lecture today. Uh, I just want to make it just coincide with the other sections as well. So all the material just kind of like in the same pace here. So here, what I want you to think right now is now I am giving you a closed surface. It's a balloon now, it's a blue balloon. There is an electric field piercing through this one from left to right. Okay, now here comes the question I'm having. Well, guys, if I'm having some piece of area, let's call that number one there, number two here, and number three is on here. I want you to find out what is the flux through each piece of surface, one, two, and three. How much is it going to be? Okay, sounds good. So what I'm going to do here is this. Because this is a piece of area, you always be able to give it an area vector. So that's what it is. Bam, right there. And because this piece is probably small, so let me call it a delta A for now. And you guys start to be able to guess that I'm introducing the delta means eventually it's going to turn into a differential and then that's going to lead you to calculus. Yes, you're right. Okay. <laughs> that's coming. But for now, let's say that's just a mini piece of area pointing in that direction. And now you can see that your electric field at that location is pointing in this direction, right? So what you want to calculate is just the flux on this surface. So flux on the surface, number one, is simply E dot with the delta A vector, or it's just E delta A cosine theta. If you know the theta, the angle between them, that's it, it's easy. That's what you're going to get as your answer, cool? But the point that I'm making at this, I mean, this moment right now is, as you can see, your theta is still less than 90 degrees. So everyone knows that cosine theta will give you some numbers, but it's still positive anyway, that is fine. So you can see that this is the case that you have a positive flux, correct? Now let's move on to the surface number two, shall we? So if the surface number two is down here and then you draw once again your area vector that's always point perpendicular to any area, electric field still point in the same direction toward your right side. Now you can see that now these two vectors making a 90 degree with each other. This is the case that the electric field does not penetrating this piece of area. Cool. So what you have over here is the flux through number two is going to be E delta A cosine 90. And that is definitely zero because there's no flux through it. Cool. Now move on to number three. So the number three, now you look at the sort of like the left side of this balloon and you can see that now your surface area is sort of pointing backward relative to the electric field that is still pointing forward to your right side. Cool. There. 
So in this case, you do the same calculation just like before. The flux through surface number three is going to be E times delta A and then cosine theta. But now your theta is going to be something bigger than 90 degree now. So with that, everyone knows that this cosine theta eventually will give you a negative value. So now you can see that you either can have positive flux, zero flux, or negative flux. Depends on the direction of the E and the A. This is the same scenario that you saw with the work done by the force F. You can have positive work done, zero work done when you apply force perpendicular to the displacement, or you can have a negative work done, for example, like work done by the friction. Same thing over here because this is just a dot product between two vectors. So that means the flux can be either positive, zero, or negative. Cool? Now here comes the question I want you to think about during the break. I'm going to take a break right now. When you look at this whole scenario here in front of you, can you sort of guess what does the flux is trying to tell you? All right? And then we'll come back and discuss what does it mean there. Okay, and what that I mean, what I'm saying is, what does it mean by having positive flux, negative flux, or no flux at all? All right, so we'll talk more about this after the break, guys. Take 10 here, yeah? Okay. Okay, so the reason I want you to think about this figure and try to imagine what will happen once we know the sign of the flux is this. So when you look at this one, and then you can see that the positive flux means something is coming out, <laughs> coming out of the enclosed volume. Does that make sense? Okay. While the negative flux, it means something is trying to penetrate in, into the enclosed volume. Cool. And the zero flux means it doesn't want to penetrate, right? Because we already talked about zero flux means there's no penetration. So it means this flux doesn't do anything to the internal volume of this closed surface. Cool? So what I'm trying to say over here is when you have a positive flux, it's sort of like a signature or it's sort of like an evidence showing that there is some vector or some lines or some whatever you want to call it trying to escape from the enclosed volume. And when you have a negative flux, those vectors or electric field lines is entering, try to get into the volume. So this is a very good concept. Concepts about flux is not only be able to use within the, the topics of electric city or magnetic field in the future, but it will work, for example, is simply just like a water flow. <laughs> think of it that way, right? Okay. So if you think of these arrows to be like a stream, a water stream, some water flow, yeah? And then what you have over here is like there is a volume. You can think of this volume like a tank of water. So out, the positive flux is just an outflux. The flux that is a water is outflow from your tank. The negative flux is the inflow so there is an influx of the water into your tank. And when you have a zero flux, it just means it doesn't really change the amount of water inside your tank. It doesn't have an in or out. Does that make sense? Or you can think of this flux to be like a heat flux. Heat, heat, just like what we learned in thermodynamics. Now you can see that, okay, if you have a flow of heat, a thermal energy flow, and then you have like I mean, this this closed surface could be like a room, for example, or maybe like a factory or an, an experimental uh, chamber or whatever. Then you say that there is an influx of heat and an outflux of heat. So by finding out the net amount of flux, you should be able to calculate, will this room getting hotter or it's going to get cooler due to the flow of this heat? Is that cool? So you might be able to define something called heat flux. And now we can use this concept of flux everywhere, whatever you like. And this is one thing that we're going to use today. It's just, even though those, those, those things that I was just um, gave you an example is more like a dynamic stuff, it's something moving. But what we are using over here is pretty much static. It's electric field lines. 
but the concept of flux can be used to in, in sort of like a indicate is like an indicator saying that is that the amount of outward and the amount of inward of those vectors or of those flux is how much you will be able to use use this information to figure out the net amount of things that is pointing out and pointing in does that make sense okay, okay. I don't know, it might not make sense now, but take a look at the next slide, it might help. So with that idea in mind, so now it will be like a natural thing for you to do. It's just like finding the net amount of flux through any surface. The way that you do, you just you know slice those surface into a tiny piece. And now each piece will give you that area vector Okay, and then if you have an electric field that you want to calculate the flux pointing in some direction, making some angle with it, the net flux on this piece alone, you know now, is just that E dot with that mini A, right? Okay, but then what we're going to do is if that surface is a smooth, continuous surface, what you can do is you just reduce this one down to a super, super, super duper tiny area that's an infinitesimally small surface area a and that you can name it da differential of a so you can turn this tiny 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 when it's tiny you can say just like a mini flux delta but then when everything just turned into super duper small you can call it like a d flux it's going to be vector e dot with the d of a cool and now, if you want the net amount of flux through the whole closed surface, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> sum them up. When you sum them up, what does it mean? It means you just slide this one into a tiny piece. You do that dot, take the next one, do that dot, e dot da, 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 e dot And then you do the whole closed surface. To emphasize that this thing is going to happen on a closed surface. I'm gonna put a symbol there, a circle symbol on top. That circular symbol over there just signify that this surface integral, see, this is surface and this is integral. So that's the name in vector calculus there, guys. That's called okay. <laughs> surface integral. But the surface that you are doing over here is closed surface, always, okay? Once you complete this integral, that will be your net flux through that closed surface. You are done. Okay. And you will be able to have a chance to calculate those flux across some particular shape of the closed surface. We're not going to go as crazy as like super weird shape, but it's going to be the shape that you guys are familiar with. For example, maybe a sphere maybe like a cylinder or maybe like a cube, something that is doable in terms of, you know, do the analysis on paper. Cool. All right. But before we get to those detailed calculation and stuff, what I want you to see is this. Look at the first one, guys. Now, let's think intuitively. What are you seeing over here? So your closed surface is just this balloon over here is a sphere. So can you guess, or is it not supposed to be a guess now? <laughs> can you tell me the net flux on this closed surface is positive or negative? What do you think? Right? What do you think? Do you think the net flux on this spherical surface here is supposed to be positive or negative? Very good. All right. Very nice. There's somebody answered already. Very good. Cool. Supposed to be positive. Why? Because well done. this piece of area, you're going to have the surface area DA pointing out. But now as the arrow showing that your electric field is pointing out. See? So as you can see now, the angle between the electric field vector and the DA always zero. Nice. No matter where you look at. It's like DA. Cool. Electric field, cool. See? So everything will give you all positive flux, positive flux, positive. When I say positive, positive flux. Yeah. 
so it won't get confused with the positive charge. <laughs> okay, so what you have over here is the net flux supposed to be positive. Cool. All right, so I think you get a sense of what is about to happen here. What about the second figure here, guys? Now you have a closed surface in the form of a cylinder, but now your electric field is just going down, straight down. So first thing first, but then when I look at this one, mm, there's a surface there, mm, surface on the side, cool. All right, on the side, there will be no flux. Let me put flux on the side because there's no penetration through the side surface, sure. What do you think about the net flux on this closed surface, guys? What do you think? Mm -hmm. A little bit of motivation here. <laughs> okay, what do you think for the second case here? So the non-zero flux supposed to happen on the top surface at least. I think you can see this. Well, okay, Dan, I can see that. So the top surface, that's non-zero. The bottom surface as well, that will be non-zero. Cool? However, if you look at the top surface, the surface area on top, BA is pointing up. You guys with me? Area is always pointing outward from the enclosed volume. We have a closed surface at this point. But your electric field at this point is pointing down. So now you have an angle of 180 degrees. So what you're getting over here is you're going to get the flux here to be negative on top surface. Cool? With me? But that agreed with what we just learned over here. When you have negative flux, means the electric field lines is penetrating into your enclosed volume. Cool? Okay. Same thing. Now, I hope you see the application right here. Okay? Now, pay attention to the bottom surface now. The bottom surface will have the DA pointing downward, right? Outward from the enclosed volume. Your electric field at this point is also pointing down. Electric field is always down in this particular case. So what you have over here is you have two vectors are already parallel to each other. So the theta is zero. So the flux on this bottom surface supposed to be positive. Or which is an out flux. The flux is coming out of the enclosed volume. But from the look of it, if the electric field lines over here representing a uniform electric field, so that means the electric field is, has a constant magnitude, the flux on top and the flux in the bottom are supposed to be exactly the same, and they're supposed to cancel each other out. Does that make sense? So that means what you can conclude over here is your net flux in this particular case is supposed to be zero. Okay. okay? So the second case over here, why? Because now you say that the inward flux, the influx from the top surface cancel with the out flux in the, on the bottom surface perfectly. So there is no net flux on this cylindrical closed surface. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you see where we're going, yeah? Try the third one, guys. Now your electric field points from left to right. Now you have a cube. Look at the cube here, but then, mm, from the look of it, there's a front surface, there's a top surface, there's a bottom surface, there's a back surface, and there is a left one and the right one. There's a left surface here, and there is a right surface there. So which one gives you non-zero flux, guys? As the figure already gave you a clue. <laughs> The reason I drew, I highlighted one yellow because it is the same scenario as the yellow on the left case. So this one on the left surface, your electric field is pointing to your right. Your surface area is pointing to the left. That's your DA. Cool. So over here, once again, on this surface here, you will get, let me call left. You get a negative flux because the angle between them is 180 degrees. All right, so let me put like a, a, a thinner, a 
thinner black first. So this is a mini case over here. So this flux on the left is just negative. Cool. And now when you look at the right surface, electric field is still pointing to your right, but now you are DA pointing to your right as well. So now these two, uh, these two vectors are parallel to each other. So over here, you can say that the flux, whatever you calculate on the right surface, is supposed to give you a positive flux. And now the other surfaces, the one on top, nothing, front, nothing, bottom, nothing, behind, nothing. So there's nothing else that give you a non-zero flux. So there are only two non-negative surfaces, uh, non-negative flux surfaces are only just the left and the right. But once again, when you look at this, well done, the influx on the left surface and the outflux on the right surface are exactly the same amount because electric field has the same magnitude. So what you can conclude once again on this one is the net flux on this case is supposed to be zero one more time. Okay. Cool. All right. So this is what I'm trying to get you to add is just trying to understand what the flux is and how to calculate flux through any surfaces. And the surface that we are talking about has a special shape, which is supposed to be closed. We want closed surfaces. Okay. And what we agree right now, right here is, now you understand what does it mean by positive flux? It means electric field vector leaking out, pointing out. Negative flux means electric field is get into the closed surface. And what you want is you want the net amount of flux. So you have to do this flux calculation all around everywhere, okay? And once you have that, then you will be able to make the connection, which I think you can guess what is supposed to happen, all right? My environment is going crazy at this point, <laughs> but I think I'm down to the conclusion. Almost, almost, guys, stick with me a little bit. So I hope by going through these three cases, you already had a clue here. How can we relate flux through the something else that is inside that closed surface? And we are going to make that connection next time under Gauss's law. Sounds good? All right, guys. So next time, we're going to start doing the calculation with these examples right here. However, today, I think this is a good place to stop. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. It's going to be a little bit shorter today, guys, because the uh, well, environment here is kind of like kind of loud. I don't think maybe the sound leaking. You guys hear the background noise as well? Yes or no? There's like a vacuum cleaner going on, stuff going on. Do you hear that? Maybe? Hmm. Well, if not, it will be great. <laughs> so this microphone is kind of nice. Okay. All right. But anyway, I think the material is sort of stop here for this particular lecture because this is going to match the other section as well. And next time, we're going to dive into numerical calculations and eventually Gauss's law and its applications. Sounds good? All right, guys, thank you for sticking around. All right, um, it might cut it short today, but it just don't want to go too much deeper than it's supposed to be, guys. Okay, guys, thank you so much. And then I will see you on Wednesday, yeah? All right, bye-bye.